Hello beautiful people, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Brina and today we're gonna be talking about Henry Lee Lucas Lust. I do my makeup. If you've been watching these last couple of episodes like this, then you know that I don't really love the name of my series and so I'm just gonna not call it anything for a little while and maybe, maybe I'll come up with something better. I don't know. So, Henry Lee Lucas was born in a one room a log cabin in Blacksburg, Virginia on August 23rd, 1936. He was the youngest of nine children. His father was Anderson, no legs. Lucas, he was a double amputee, hence the nickname, no legs. He lost both of his legs in a workplace accident. And then um, he subsequently made his living thereafter by illegally making and selling alcohol. He was also a full-blown alcoholic himself. Henry's mother, Viola Dixon Lucas, was really no better than his father. She was a prostitute, also an alcoholic and the ruler of their one room log cabin. When describing his childhood, Henry was once quoted saying, I hated all my life. I hated everybody. When I first grew up and can remember, I was dressed as a girl by my mother and I stayed that way for two or three years. And after that, I was treated like what I call the family dog. I was beaten. I was made to do things that no human being would want to do. So, as long as you believe what Henry says about his childhood, it was really not good. He was introduced to alcohol by his father at a very young age, and he was often made the focus of his mother's rage. So according to Henry, when he was around eight years old, his mother Viola beat him over the head with a wooden plank so hard that he ended up spending three days in a coma following that beating. He also says that as a child, she would force him to watch her having sex with her Johns. And like I said before in the little quoted statement from him, she would force him to cross dress. And it wasn't just like around the house, treat him like a girl, no. She took him out in public dressed as a girl. And this was allegedly so she would be able to pimp him out to men and women alike. Eventually the cross-dressing stopped, but only after his school teachers started to complain and there was a court order telling Viola she could no longer dress Henry as a girl. Then when Henry was around 10 years old, he got in a fight with one of his brothers, you know, as brothers do. It resulted with Henry having an eye injury to his left eye, but his injury just went ignored until eventually it was infected so bad that he had to have his eye removed and he was fitted with a glass eye. That didn't actually happen until he was around 11. And by this point, Henry is basically a full-blown alcoholic himself. Around the same time, Henry's lovely older half-brother and uncle decided to introduce him to bestiality. Yeah as well as animal torture. He also said around the same time that he was introduced to all these things by his brother, he also started having sex with his brother. So... And then fast forward to one December night in 1949, Henry's father Anderson arrives home completely obliterated and he ends up passing out outside, can't even make it inside, well, it happens to be during a blizzard, so Anderson ends up dying of hypothermia. And around that same time, when Henry was in sixth grade, he decided to drop out of school and run away from home. I'm guessing with his father not around anymore, things probably just got a lot worse with his mother, so yeah. By the way, I really have no idea what look I'm going for here, so bear with me. And according to Henry, he committed his first murder shortly after he left home in 1951 at the age of just 15. He claims he strangled a 17-year-old Laura Burnsley after she refused his sexual advances. Although, like with many of his confessions, he later recanted this one. In 1954, Henry is now 18 years old when he is arrested for a number of burglaries in and around the Richmond, Virginia area. As a result of that arrest, Henry was sentenced to four years in prison, which let's face it was basically a luxury vacation compared to his one room log cabin he grew up in with no running water or electricity, so let's be real, he probably really didn't hate prison too much. 
1957, Henry was able to escape from prison, but he was recaptured just three days later and he was officially released on September 2nd, 1959. While Henry was doing this prison stint, he began corresponding with a pen pal and eventually the two got engaged. Following his release on September 2nd, 1959, Henry traveled to Tecumseh, Michigan to stay with his older half-sister, Opal. Just a few months later in December, Viola decided to come visit her children for Christmas, and she also let it be known to Henry that she did not at all approve of his fiance. She then continuously begged Henry to come back and care for her in her old age. Henry refused, and the two continuously argued about this matter for the next month or so, until on January 11th, 1960, this pestering resulted in a fatal argument. Henry claims Opal struck him over the head with a broomstick after he once again refused to go back home with her, so he stabbed her in the neck. Because what else are you going to do? If your mom won't stop bother bothering you and she hits you in the head with a broomstick, of course you stab her in the neck. Henry claims he didn't really mean to stab her in the neck, though. He claims he just meant to slap her. Um, how do you... Who slaps somebody in the neck? And then he says after he slapped her, she fell to the ground and started bleeding. And then that's when he noticed the knife in his hand. Yeah, I'm not buying it either. So... Thinking his mother is dead, Henry flees the scene. When his sister Opal returned home later, she found their mother still alive, but in a pool of blood. She called an ambulance, but it arrived too late. It's officially stated Viola died of a heart attack that was precipitated by the assault. So soon after that, Henry is arrested in or around the outskirts of Ohio, and he is immediately claiming self-defense. That claim, though, was rejected by the court. Subsequently, he was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to up to 40 years imprisonment. Unfortunately, though, in June 1970, Henry is released after serving only 10 years of his sentence due to prison overcrowding. One year following this release, Henry is arrested again, this time for attempting to kidnap three schoolgirls, and he's sentenced to five years in prison. Well, serving this sentence, he develops yet another romantic relationship, this time with like a family friend. I read somewhere it, it's possibly a sister-in-law or a brother's sister-in-law, something confusing like that. Either way, weird. And she's a single mother and she began writing to him while he was incarcerated. When he was released in 1975, he moved to Pennsylvania and the two married. But that marriage ended after about two years when he was accused of sexually abusing her daughters. Following that relationship, Henry became a drifter. He began moving around between various relatives' homes until one got him a job in West Virginia, where he began yet another romantic relationship that ended when her family confronted him about more abuse allegations. Then <laughs> Henry makes the best decision of his life and he befriends a serial killer by the name of Otis Toole. He settles in Jacksonville, Florida with Otis and his family. Otis lived with his parents at the time, so Henry just kind of moved into the house with the three of them. This actually proved to be a period of stability in Henry's life for maybe the first time ever. Um, yeah, he got a job as a roofer, he would fix neighbors' cars, and he would scavenge up scrap to make extra money. Eventually, Henry is introduced to Otis's niece, Frida Becky Powell. She had been placed in a state shelter following her mother's and grandmother's deaths in 1982, and as I said, she is an adolescent. So I'd say this is about the time when things kind of start to go off the deep end again for him. Henry ended up convincing Becky, who was about 12 years old at the time, to run away with him. Keep in mind, Henry's like old. It's at least the 1980s, so that put Henry at like 50. And she's 12. Wow, I just put that together. That's gross. 
moving on, Henry was able to convince Becky to run away with him and live on the road. Eventually, the two made their way to California where they were offered a job looking after 82-year-old Kate Rich. Although this job did not last very long, they were eventually fired for basically not doing their jobs as well as stealing from Kate. So the two continued on hitchhiking until they were picked up by a minister of the prayer house in Stoneburg, Texas. The minister thought the two were a married couple. At this point, Becky is 15 and he offers Lucas a job as a roofer and allows the two to stay in a small apartment on the commune. Shortly after arriving on the commune, Becky starts feeling homesick for Florida. Um, yeah, I feel like a commune's probably just not like the best place to live, so that's probably why. Then suddenly Becky disappeared. Whenever he was questioned about be where Becky was, Henry said that she left him at a truck stop while the two were in Bowie, Texas. Then in June of 1983, Henry is arrested for unlawful possession of a firearm by Texas Ranger Phil Ryan. While being interrogated, Henry confesses to the murders of Becky Powell and Kate Rich. He leads police to remains, claiming that this is Becky and Kate, although forensic evidence was inconclusive, and the coroner stopped short of identifying either of the victims. But Henry's cooperation in just outright confessing to these murders and then leading them, leading police to these remains really would boost his credibility in later confessions and other crimes. Though Henry later ended up denying any involvement in the murders of Kate Rich and Becky Powell. In November of 1983, Henry was transferred to jail in Williamson County, Texas. He claims while there he attempted suicide after receiving rough treatment. He claims police stripped him naked, denied him of cigarettes and bedding, held him in a cold cell, tortured his genitalia, and did not allow him to contact his attorney. He went through another series of interviews with law enforcement officers where he con confessed to additional unsolved murders. At first, it was about 60 that he confessed to, and then soon that number became 100, and then 150. So, they decided to form what they called the Lucas Task Force. Because Henry was confessing to all these murders and cooperating with law enforcement, they gave him a preferential treatment. He was frequently taken to restaurants, rarely handcuffed, allowed to wander the police station and jails at will. He knew the codes for the security doors, and they even brought him his favorite milkshake quite often. So, obviously, Henry loved all this attention he was getting, and he just kept confessing to murders. Eventually, he had confessed to an astounding 3,000 murders, and at no point did anyone in this task force go, wait, maybe he's just confessing to confess. Maybe, maybe he didn't actually do these things. Or maybe, maybe we should look into his alibi of where he was at the time of these murders. No, police never, ever did any of that. They just were happy to clear 213 previously unsolved murders because Henry confessed to them and he he knew details of the crime that only the killer would know, right? You would think. You would think only the killer and police would know these details. Well, as it turns out, Henry was given access to the case files he was confessing to by the police. He was allowed to read them, obviously, and in the confession tapes, it shows that if Henry was confessing to something and police didn't really seem to agree with what he was saying, he would change his story until he made the police happy. So, how can you really trust the guy? And since he was allowed to read the case files, he was able to come up with convincingly detailed confessions, making it virtually impossible to determine if he was telling the truth. Henry claims in 1983 he killed an unidentified woman, later identified as Michelle Busha, 
along Interstate 90 in Minnesota. When further questioned by police about this murder he claims he committed, he gave inconsistent details on how he claimed he killed her and also the location. Therefore, he was eliminated as a suspect. In 1984, he confesses to the murder of another unidentified young woman, referred to at the time as Caldona Jane Doe, who had been discovered a shot to death in a field outside of Caldona, New York on November 10th of 1979. Once again, investigators found insufficient evidence to support his confession, and it's believed he also falsely confessed to the 1980 slaying of yet another unidentified woman in Louisiana. Although in 2015, both unidentified women were identified through DNA. Caldona Jane Doe turned out to be Hammy Alexander, whose murder still remains unsolved. And the unidentified woman in Louisiana was Harold Cole also still unsolved. So once word got out about all these confessions that Henry was making and that police were closing all these cases because of him, some people really started to get suspicious, rightfully so. Specifically, a couple of journalists, a journalist by the name of Hugh Ainsworth and others, investigated the veracity of Henry's claims. And they found his confessions very suspicious from the start. They were able to piece together the dates and settings for each of these murders that Henry was claiming he had committed. And they quickly found holes that suggested Henry was not, in fact, behind most of these murders he was confessing to. They calculated Henry would have had to use his 13-year-old Ford station wagon to cover 11,000 miles in one month to have committed the crimes the task force attributed to him. That, no. So the fact that police weren't able to figure that out, but journalists were... Clearly, whoever was on that task force should not have been in law enforcement. There was a piece posted in the Dallas Times Herald in 1985 by Hugh Ainsworth and fellow journalist Jim Henderson, where they laid out exactly how the geographical logistics of Henry's claims would have made it impossible for him to be at every murder. So, in a few examples of where the police just completely dropped the ball, they accepted a confession for a September 12th, 1981 murder in Houston. But records show Henry was in jail in Maryland at the time of the murder. I mean, he was in jail. How could he have done it? So by all accounts, it seems like the task force really did not care about actually getting justice for these victims. All they really cared about was closing the cases to get them off the books and make their department look better. So in spite of his hundreds and hundreds and all of his false confessions, Henry still remained convicted of 11 murders. And he ended up being sentenced to death for one of them in particular, a then unidentified woman who was dubbed Orange Socks. Her body was found in Williamson County, Texas on Halloween 1979. So Henry was sentenced to death for this murder, despite the fact there was a timesheet recording his presence at work that very same day in Jacksonville, Florida. How? Yeah, the police just did not. They were just like, oh, you want to confess? Yeah, okay, go ahead, do it, do it, do it, confess. We'll take it. Eventually, in 1998, his sentence was commuted to life in prison when the then-governor, George W. Bush, discovered details in his confession came from the case file, which had been given to him to read. Eventually, in 2019, Orange Sox was officially identified as Deborah Jackson, who was 23 years old at the time of her death. Then on March 12th, 2001, at 11 p.m., Henry Lee Lucas was found dead in prison from congestive heart failure. He died at age 64 in Huntsville, Texas. As of 2020, DNA evidence has verified that Henry did not kill at least 20 of his supposed victims, while the remaining are still being verified. Though there's a very strong possibility, like we've already talked about, that he did not commit many, most of the murders he confessed to. In his final years, he filed many appeals stating, I am not a serial killer, and that he falsely confessed to all of those crimes. So, let me know in the comments what you think about this case. Do you think Henry Lee Lucas is a serial killer or a serial liar? Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!